Megan Griffiths, come on down! Hey, can I bring some other folks down Please here? Please bring a lot of folks down here. First of all, I just want to invite Lou Diamond Phillips. Young Kit and Young Richard. Yeah. 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 And there are a lot of other cast and crew, and I just want to invite anyone who would like to join us down here. There are so many of you. I just want to invite you all down here if you would like to come down. Otherwise, I'm going to make you stand up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here comes Celia Beasley, our editor. For some reason, not joining me. So stand up, you guys. <laughs> Matt Brady and Lisa Taker. <laughs> and everybody else who's in this room who worked on this movie in any form, please stand up right now. So I've been reading a lot of press with you the last couple of days about this film and I Yeah, I've been talking a lot. Um, and I'm, 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 I want to ask Lou Diamond Phillips some questions. But first, I, there's one very important question I need to ask you. Okay. You are one of the sunniest, brightest, <laughs> nicest people that I know. She farts yeah. rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> but you are really able to get in the head of some dark characters. And I was wondering, what is your process for doing that? Do you really have a process for doing it or does it just come to you? I'm secretly a murderer. I know. <laughs> um, no, I, I think I just, I get really interested in these kind of characters because I kind of want to know why. I just, with him especially, I just wanted to know why he ended up like this and I just wanted to dig into mm -hmm. him as a person and, and his background and understand him a little bit better. And I really do credit that interest and, and sort of just desire to understand someone's humanity with um, my mother, who was a social worker, and, and she worked with abused kids her whole career, and would, you know, really, she would really do, she would really look for the best in people and try to understand where they came from, and I, and I think that it, that came from her. I think what was really interesting in the film is that you made Richard Ramirez uh, a, a really relatable character. Um, and I think part of that was in the writing, and part of that was in the writing. Who doesn't want to have coffee with that guy? So that, <laughs> that's a good transition point. Uh, Lou, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to the character and how you came to building him as more than just the uh, boogeyman character? Uh, wow. Uh, first of all, it's really difficult to, to face your younger self. <laughs> you got, you know, I look uh, like, like you're my age, you look back, you got a lot of regrets. There's a lot of things you want to say to your younger self. <laughs> your choice of hairstyle, first of all. <laughs> Even though some of you are still rocking the metal 80s hairdo. <laughs> um... The basis of your question is the is the uh, basic reason why I said yes to this film in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that is that Megan Griffith, this lady right here, created a fictional conceit wherein we got inside the mind of this guy. But not only do we get inside the mind of Richard Ramirez, it was it was this chess game, this journey, this this mirror image between himself and Kit. Uh, beautifully portrayed by you as the younger kid. Uh, and, and the amazing Bellamy Young, I wish to God she was here because she is a light. She is an angel and she is uh, uh, 
certainly one of the finest leading ladies I, I, I've ever worked with, and I've been around a while. Um, although they never let me work with leading ladies, it's usually like horses and shit. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's... The, the, the thing about it is, this is a fictional film, but, but Richard Ramirez is a very, very real, you know, human being. Uh, and, and I think we all wonder, man, we all wonder about the dark sides of ourselves, we wonder about the dark sides of uh, humanity, uh, and, and, and there's a certain classicism to this. I said this in an interview earlier today. It's why we wonder about Macbeth, why we wonder about Oedipus, why we wonder about Iago. Uh, we have been examining this in art and literature and theater uh, as long as we've been able to, you know, contemplate the human existence. What is it about us that goes wrong? What synapses fail to fire? What damage occurs to us in our minds and in our souls to create something that, that can uh, perpetrate this kind of horror on mankind? Uh, and this is not a, a work of fiction, you know, the Night Stalker existed. And so for me, it was, um, you know, t investigating that, trying to wrap my head around him as a human being. And uh, uh, the, the research, you know, it's, it's, it's always so stupid to say this, but they said, how'd you like doing this role? It's like, it was a lot of fucking fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, I read the book, I watched the videos, I talked to Detective Gil Carrillo, who uh, was in the film as well. And it's, you know, I mean, for an actor, it's like, please, give me a seven-course fucking meal. This is beautiful, you know? I got the appetizer and the steak and the dessert and the, you know, aperitifs and everything else. I mean, you know, you know, we love this shit. Is that out of line for Seattle? No, that was right in line for Seattle. Maybe the Orange County, but we're okay here. You know, and, and, and so it was, it was uh, uh, a beautiful thing to undertake and, and to, um, you know, wrap my head around. But, but, but ultimately what was most important and what started with, with Megan's script and, and with, with her foundation is truth. I had to put truth up there. I, I had to divorce myself and, and not apologize to you, the audience, and say, this is this guy as I see him and, and give you him in, in all of his devious, disgusting, frightening glory. And, uh, and, and that's why I said yes to this film. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I also read that you have some very nice things to say about working with Megan uh, and with working with um, uh, Patricia uh, Ringan for the 33, which you were fantastic in, by the way. That movie is awesome. If anybody uh, he's here. the flip side of this. Uh, Don Lucio in the 33 is full of love and light and yeah. so much heart and hope. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, if you're really having nightmares, go rent the 33 because it's a good <laughs> And I survive in that. Um. <laughs> but you've been in this business, and you've been in the business for a long time, and I was wondering, have you seen a change in attitudes towards female directors over the last five, six years? Um, we're on the cusp of this, folks. We are at the crest of the wave. Uh, there is a lot of conversation going on uh, in the country in Hollywood right now. Uh, Megan Griffith is, and you should be very, very proud of her. Uh, the, the, I mean, cutting edge of a lot of things for a long time and so that's why I am incredibly proud to be here tonight uh, <laughs> debuting this film uh, this conversation is happening uh, throughout our country and it is about time um, I've had the great fortune uh, as you said uh, with the, the 33 uh, with Patricia Regan uh, a Mexican-American filmmaker some people might take offense to that uh, yeah uh, 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 I was also, I did a, a brief uh, appearance in Sky with uh, uh, Diane Kruger and Norman Reedus, which is doing the festival circuit as well, yeah, yeah. also a female director. Uh, the, the director that I'm working with presently on Longmire is a Puerto Rican female director. Yeah. We are on the crest of the wave and we must keep this wave going. Uh, it, it is very, very important that films like this get seen, get talked about, get discussed, not just for their face value, but for the fact that uh, some very talented and underutilized people uh, came together to make it. Uh, Megan Griffiths put together probably the most female heavy 
key department head film I have ever, ever been involved in. you to sleep but but this is the first time when when, when we've had a woman in in a, a producer alisa who's here tonight as well but you know our editor celia thank you you know uh, uh, our cinematographer q almost every single one of the major key positions on this film was occupied by a woman and you see the result <laughs> this is not a watered down chick flick right <laughs> I know it's showing on Lifetime, but you know what? It's, uh, <laughs> movies for men and women, goddammit. <laughs> but the point is this, is that talented people, led by people like this, who make sure that she widens her horizons, put the right person in the position that they deserve to be in. This, this is, is the land... Uh, who, Oh god, am I gonna go here? <laughs> Who knows, maybe the highest office in the land will be a woman. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> My point is we are on a wave and we and we need to support this and we need to endorse this. And dudes, I'm you know, those of you with testicles, you too. You know. Uh, um, film, in my mind, uh, is one of uh, the art forms, well, uh, many art forms where it really does not matter. It does not matter if you got a Y or an X chromosome. It is, it is about your, your heart, your intelligence, your perspective on life, and, and, and how you do the job. Uh, it doesn't matter how much you can lift, how fast you can run, how many bullets you can take, whatever. We have to support women in the arts, and, and uh, uh, very proud that this film is, is one of the flagships of that movement, and we will hope to continue that movement forever. And this woman is a pioneer, right? <laughs> Thank you. I want to toss it to the audience to ask some questions, but I want to ask you one more okay. question first, Megan. Uh, uh, you're one of Seattle's homegrown. I mean, you're not from here originally, but close enough, Adopted. close enough. Why didn't you change the setting of this film from California to Seattle? No, just kidding. <laughs> but seriously, uh, the, the story of the Night Stalker came from sort of a personal place for you. Can you talk a little bit about where, you know, your relationship to Richard Ramirez growing up and, and how terrifying that was and how that informed the film? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I, uh, I lived in Riverside, California when I was a kid and I was 10 years old when Ramirez was on the prowl and I, I had a bedroom that faced the road. I really thought he was gonna, it was beige. Um, I really thought he was gonna sneak into my window and be at the foot of my bed. That's the imagery of him standing at the foot of beds across the movie is pulled from my nightmares. And, uh, and so yeah, he, it was when Elisa Tager started talking to me about this project and said she had this book about uh, the Night Stalker, I said, Richard Ramirez and I, like it immediately caught me and it made me interested and I we, we started talking about taking this sort of humanist approach and looking into him as a person and uh, and sort of demystifying him and demythologizing him a little bit and uh, and uh, and it just yeah it came to life out of that and where did the character of Kit come from in that process was she something you had in mind originally for the film or was it a way for you to sort of um, insert that voice a little bit more into the story I mean, she was basically, when I was thinking how I wanted to get into this story, I thought, if I could do anything, I just want to sit across from him and ask him why. Mm. And he had died about a year before I started writing this script, so that wasn't going to be Thank possible. Thank goodness, I really didn't want him to see this. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know if I could have done it if he was still alive. But uh, he, he, was, he had passed, and so uh, I started talking to Gil Carrillo, who was a consultant in the movie, was a detective who, who tracked and caught the Night Stalker, and, uh, and just um, Kit was, came out of this desire to have somebody sitting face to face with him and trying to figure out uh, where he came from, who he was and to design someone who ran a bit parallel to him, as Lou was talking about, and, and really get, um, get into the minds of all of us in our darkness and, and capability and, and for, for doing evil things yeah. and, for, uh, and our capability of overcoming childhood trauma, which Richard did not do very successfully, and Kit, I believe, does. <laughs> I, I also want to point out really quickly, uh, um, Renee is here, uh, the, the casting Amy of Renee. these two. I'm sorry? Amy Renee. A, uh, Amy Renee, yeah. A, Amy Renee, yes. Uh, the, uh, the casting of these two. <laughs> 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 there's 
chin. Of course, she's got Bellamy's chin. And, and, and this guy, but but I mean, the other thing is too, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a testament to, to Megan's script and her direction that we filmed these sequences separately, and, and yet these two so incredibly captured the younger versions of ourselves. And, and this is the second time I've seen the film, and, and, and this convergence where you and I start looking more and more like each other is <laughs> really disturbing. <laughs> it, was, it was scary. But uh, 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 we filmed, uh, Bellamy and I filmed, you know, uh, like a two-person, two you know, one-act play. In, in, in that room, you know, for what a week and a half or whatever. But everybody else here, you know, created uh, uh, the um, the rest of the story, which which so informs what I did because I, I, I'm just sitting there in a room talking. Uh, and and uh, I really I just really want to give kudos to the rest of the cast. <laughs> Questions from the audience. Who has a question for anybody? Any of these people? Yes. I would like to ask Megan. In making this movie, what was the most difficult uh, issue, most difficult decision you had to make? Megan, what was the most difficult decision you had to make uh, in the making of this film? Me or John Stamos? <laughs> I mean, it's a hard question. There was, you know, you make about a, a thousand decisions a day when you're directing, and and uh, they they all come out of an instinctual place. I don't really feel like I got tortured over anything specific. Um, I, you know, everything just kind of flowed from the script. I think it was really figuring out who, uh, like, how to how to guide the script process um, and and keep it balanced between the two the two leads. And, and also, you know, in the edit room, just, you know, making those torturous decisions about losing things and, um, and making the momentum flow. Those, those are always hard to, to cut your little babies out of the movie. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Next question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my question's for the, the young stalker. <laughs> Hello. I, I think I'd like to say that you're probably a pretty good killer. <laughs> uh, yes, I've definitely done that before. Sort of. One thing that I really love about your role is that you're able to sort of capture this sort of like uneasy, uh, aroused sort of you know screwball uh, adolescent male. And I was curious, was there was there a way that you're able to kind of tap into that? Method actor. <laughs> <laughs> that is my life. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, yeah, we all kind of go through those like awkward stages, and uh, I was a, kind of a quiet kid, and you got to come out of your shell eventually, and kind of just use my own experiences uh, <laughs> to, uh, to sort of deal with the filming and stuff. He also started walking around Los Angeles in black uh, shirt, black pants, and white tennis shoes. That's true. I still do that. <laughs> Next question. They got it. I understand. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, in case I'm wrong, I'm not going to say the name of the film, but was the opening an homage to another uh, serial killer related film? Hmm. You mean the bashing? Uh, yeah, the the fighting and then her stalking down the hallway in the prison. She's asking if it was the opening was an homage, and I don't know what it would be homage to, so I guess no. Okay. Just say, <laughs> that's why I didn't say the name. Rocky Four. Four. It was an no homage wrong. to Rocky Four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A great, a great film. I have another question for you, Megan. All um, right. I, I wanted to talk to you actually a little bit about the music design of the film okay. because uh, we, we, Megan and I knew each other a little bit and we were talking about the, the kind of pop <coughs> tunes that you were picking to really evoke the era and I was wondering how did you sort of pick which songs to go in the movie and which songs, uh, which songs did you not, were you not able to include in the movie that you thought would really sort of evoke the time period? Well, the number one thing I wanted to include that we just had no budget for was ACDC because that was like a big Ramirez band. Yeah. Uh, but they're really expensive. <laughs> big budget. So, um, but we filmed Pentagram, and uh, they were the that's the song that's in the end credits and when she's in the club, and uh, and I loved that song. It felt so haunting, and 
and write for it, so I was thrilled. That was just like a relief. And then um, we loved Animotion um, Obsession because of just Kit's frame of mind, and also for me that's like such an 80s, like it just takes me right back to that time. It's one of those sort of uh, B-sides from the 80s. I was fishing for the pentagram. That was that song is awesome. Yeah, um, they just re-released it. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, and going back to the time period again, I know as a we're about the same age too. What was it like working with an actor that you watched on screen so much when you were growing up in great films like you know La Bamba and uh, Young Guns and all that? Woo! Kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Another fucking horse roll, right? <laughs> Did you, uh, was, were there any like weird anticipator, anticipatory things about working with Lou Diamond Phillips that you were just had you really excited to go into the project? I mean, number one, I'm just a big fan, and I always has, I always have been. I, I literally can recite most of Young Guns. I just was watching it on Wednesday with my boyfriend, and he can attest. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it, like, I, I've always thought he's got this incredible intensity as an actor, and he really brings that to so many of his roles, even sort of across a lot of different genres, and so I knew he'd be right for this, but, but yeah, I really just wanted to uh, meet him and at some point, you know, get him to sing karaoke of Blaze of Glory with me. Yeah. <laughs> You know what? Here at SIF, we like to make dreams come true, so... No. And uh, we just so happen to get the karaoke track for Blaze's Glory here tonight. And if you guys wouldn't mind, would you mind? I mean, Lou? Me that he would sing this song with me on the night of our yeah. premiere. Yeah, you know, and uh, yeah, the, uh, this song, Oscar nominated for John Bon Jovi. John Bon Jovi's been nominated for a fucking Oscar. I haven't. <laughs> but uh, I believe uh, this song, Blaze of Glory, was from Young Guns 2. <laughs> After a dark screening like this, maybe it's uh, it's the right way to send you out into your Saturday night, yeah. right? Okay, go ahead and start it. Yeah. <laughs> and there should be some lyrics up here, so please, by all means, sing along. Got beer. Actors, Celia, I know you want to sing some karaoke. Okay. I took my shoes off. Oh, crank it. It's way too quiet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. You gotta crank, crank that shit up. up there. Because, you know, the jeans were a lot tighter in the 80s, so I don't know if I'm gonna hit these high notes. <laughs> Did you guys think this is what was gonna happen tonight? Yeah. I know Steve Snowy thought this was gonna happen. I just wanted you to know that you're watching me check a fucking this item off right now. Wake up in the morning and I raise my weary head. I got an old coat for a pillow and the earth was last night's bed.